Does God care? Does God care? Does God care about the hundreds of thousands in Turkey and Syria that have either been killed or impacted by the earthquake? Does God care about the millions of people who who don't have enough to eat? Does God care about those who have been wrongly imprisoned? Does God care about the women and girls who are trafficked around the globe and on the internet suffering unspeakable harm to feed the greed and perversion of others? Does God care about the, the family in Hudson whose home burned down and who lost all of their earthly possessions? Does God care about the fact that the person you love has cancer? Does God care about uh, Justin Trudeau or or Joe Biden or Francois Legault? Does God care about how they lead? Does God care about the justice or injustice of their decisions? Does God care about any of these things? Does God care about you? Does he actually care specifically about your life? Does he care that you've been mistreated, abused, taken advantage of, lied to? Does God care about that thing that was done to you that you have never shared with a soul because of the shame that you feel? Does God care? When it comes to those things that are bigger than ourselves, those things that we know that we are effectively powerless to impact, the question, does God care, is a question where we yearn for the answer to be yes. We want there to be a God in heaven who cares. We want there to be a God in heaven who sees what's going on. We want there to be a God in heaven who will bring justice to the injustice and unjust suffering in this world. And knowing that this is a yearning that resides in in your heart and mine. Know this, the God of the Bible who has revealed himself to us has said, yes, I am a God who sees and I am a God who cares. And I am a God who will bring justice. Now, if the Bible, if the God of the Bible is good and just as he claims to be, then the God of all creation, the God of the universe, who is over all of time, he must also care, really care, not just about what is out there, about what others do to us or do apart from us, but he must also care, really care, about what you and I do with the fleeting moments that are our lives here on earth. Does God really care when you and I do the things we ought not do or do not do the things that we should Does God care how we worship him? Does God care about how we pray or if we pray? Does God care about how we use our money? Does God care about where we go online, the kinds of shows we watch, the kinds of music we listen to? And in a way that's intended to cause us pause and bring about repentance and reform, the living God who sees all and cares says yes. And this living God who sees and cares offers words of warning through a simple man to remind those who would claim to be his people that, yes, he does care. And because he is good and because he is just, he will judge all and he will do so by his standard, not ours. And he will do so in the here and now for the good of the lowly, of the oppressed, of the poor, of the mistreated. And he will do so in the final day, in the day of the Lord, with nothing but his glory in mind. Does God care? The answer is yes. And it should cause us pause who hear his voice through his word this morning. It should cause us to consider on what basis when accusations of all form of treachery are rightly levied against us, against you and against me, what hope, if any, you and I have on that day to stand. The writings we have of the Old Testament prophet Amos, they're weighty words. And I expect that at various points over the next six weeks, there will be portions that will be worrisome. Because you see, although you and I sit here today, and the majority among us would claim to be counted among God's people, the exposing claims of the God who sees and the God who cares will at best challenge our claim and at worst for some prove that claim to be untrue. You and I want a God who sees and a God who cares about the injustice in this world. You and I want God to deal with corrupt leaders and oppressive people. We want a God who roars. 
But to want such an examination and judgment for others is also to accept such an examination and judgment of us as well. If we want his righteous roar to reach both the plains and the mountaintops, we must accept that it must also be intended to reach our ear. I told you that Amos is a a weighty book. (laughs) It's a weighty word. But know this, because what we have ultimately is God's word, it is also a good word. It's a word that's revealing, sometimes in hard ways, but it's also healing. Now, it's likely the case that many of us have never heard a sermon from Amos before, let alone read the book ourselves, even if we have at some point. Maybe it was in an attempt to uh, complete some sort of Bible reading plan. That, that's where I checked, checked off the box before for myself. And so it was only a, a blur in my memory before I had uh, last approached it last May. While Amos is a book that has been broken down into nine nine chapters, today's time in Amos is just going to cover two verses, just two. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to open to Amos chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So what this means, if we're just looking at two verses this morning, is that in the the following five weeks, weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at some larger chunks together. But for today, just two verses. And my hope is to give us a sense of where this book is going. To encounter the God who sees, the God who cares, and the God who is just. To hear that he roars, and that we ought to take stock of our lives, even as those who call ourselves his people, and listen. So if you're able with your Bibles open, I'd invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word, and then I'll pray for us. This is the word of the Lord. The words of Amos, who is one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, what he saw regarding Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. May be seated as I pray for us. Father in heaven, uh, as our God who sees and cares about all things, we are a people who confess that the things we claim about ourselves in principle are not always true in practice. We confess that for all kinds of reasons we can be blind to this disparity. So as we approach your word to us this morning, we confess that our will does not always align with yours. But we ask that by a work of the Holy Spirit, you would discipline our hearts as a good father does, calling us to repentance and causing us to trust in your word and to walk in your ways. For the glory of your name, we ask this in the standing of Christ. Amen. So one of the concerns I have for us in engaging an Old Testament prophet is that that we would hear it as something being for them then and have little to say to us today. After all, the prophecy provided by Amos to God's people is a specific one. It was offered in a certain place and at a certain time. And that place and that time isn't here, and it's not today. And because that's the case, what can happen is that we can approach a text like this, and we can either we can either nerd out or we can check out. We can nerd out by focusing on all of the names and all of the places and get lots of information that miss the point, thinking we've accomplished something when in reality we haven't. Or we can check out, because we can hear lots of names and places and get overloaded by all kinds of information that misses the point. And so our eyes can kind of glaze over because our heart has never been engaged. The God who sees, the God who cares, the God who will judge justly. This is what all of the names and all of the places and all the examples were given in Amos point to. And while the names and places and some of the examples we'll be unpacking over the next six weeks are unique to ancient Israel, the warnings which lay bare the heart are very much for you and me today. But so that we can make sense of this together, I want to take a few minutes of our time together to situate us in the time of the text, explain what's going on, eventually making our way to why a text like this should matter to us. Uh, at the time of Amos, God, uh, Amos is bringing God's message to God's people. The kingdom is divided into two. Uh, King Uzziah is reigning in the north, 
He's reigning Israel in the north, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, is king over Judah in the south. Though they are both God's people, God's people are not one. And there is this low-grade grieving that streams its way through many of the prophets about this reality. When the people of God do not reflect the unity of God. This low-grade grieving is something I think we ought to carry to our present day, where the church, the people of God, are not one but divided, not just into distinct tribes but separate kingdoms where open hostility can and does exist. And then in days when, when Amos is bringing God's word to God's people, it's important to know that Amos was from the southern kingdom, Judah, and he was bringing a message of judgment to those in the northern kingdom, Israel. If you look back in your Bibles, just have them open to chapter 1, verse 1, you'll see that we learn that Amos was from Tekoa, which was a region in, south, in the southern kingdom. It's probably true of all of us to say that we don't always uh, receive correction, rebuke, or exhortation well. And we probably all have those days when we hear something and it just rubs us wrong. Uh, someone tells you something about your life that, that, that's clearly not okay, and we can bristle at that. We can bristle at their words because in our heart we know that they're right and we do not like being wrong. We don't like having our shortcomings pointed out to us. It doesn't feel good. And in our pride, we can receive corrective words, which are good words, as though they were bad. Because they tell us something about ourselves that we simply do not want to acknowledge to be true. And we can feel this way even when those words are coming from someone that we know loves us, uh, uh, our husband or wife, a friend, a brother or sister in the church. And if we can feel put off by such a word from someone that we know loves us, how much more do we get our noses out of joint when the person who tells us that the, the air around us stinks isn't someone we'd consider to be a friend? And this is the relationship that's presented to us in the text. You see, Amos is bringing a message of judgment to Israel in the north. But he's a southern guy. You can imagine the response. Who are you to tell us anything? Not only are you from the south, but you're not even a prophet. You're a shepherd. You take care of fig trees. Go back to your sheep. You should know that there were a lot of prophets in the Old Testament. We can often think of the prophets limited to those that we, that we have named in Scripture. But not only were there many more who we know existed who remained unnamed, but being a prophet was also a profession. There were plenty of prophets for hire. And like the shyster so-called pastors of today that can don a pearly smile and say, if you would just send me your money, God will. There were many prophets who were in it for the money and would tell the person who could pay them what they wanted, whatever they wanted. But this isn't who Amos is. In chapter 1 of verse 1, and again in chapter 7, uh, verses 14 and 15, Amos says this of himself, I was not a prophet or the son of a prophet, rather I was a herdsman, and I took care of sycamore fig trees. Again, Amos wasn't even a prophet. He, he's a shepherd and he's a keeper of fig trees. But a man is what God makes him. And his station in life does not determine the credibility of his words, should they be God's words. Throughout the scripture, we see God using the small and the weak and the lowly to make his great name known. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul encourages the Corinthian believers by saying, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world to despise things and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. Amos went on to say in 7.15, But the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. So Amos has crossed the other side of the proverbial tracks. You see, if you look back to verse 1 of chapter 1 again, we're told that what he saw took place when Jeroboam was king over Israel, and it was two years before the earthquake. I'll explain the, the significance of the former in a moment, but the latter is a time marker, and I actually think holds just particular prominence for us today. 
The recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria has been so cataclysmic that for the people that survived it, events will in some way be marked by either being before or after those days when the earth shook and life as they knew it was forever changed. And for those people who know, no dates will be needed. A simple phrase will put everything into context before the earthquake. That's all that will be needed to be said. We all have such moments. Some of them are shared as a nation, like saying something was before or after COVID or before or after 9-11. Some of them are shared moments for a church before or after Gary was the pastor. Some of them are private moments that shape a family. It was just before we learned that mom had cancer. I think that happened a couple months after the accident. This earthquake referenced in our text was so significant that the prophet Zechariah referenced it centuries later and understood it as an act of God used to remind the people of God of their need to be reliant on him and to turn their hearts back to him in repentance. As for it being a time when Jeroboam was king of Israel, know that this was the most prosperous time in Israel's history since the days of Solomon. It was a time of wealth and prosperity. This was especially true for the northern kingdom, Israel, where wealth had been amassed and all the trappings of prosperity presented themselves and were on display for all to see. And as was often true throughout Israel's history, they understood this wealth and this prosperity as a sign of God's blessing. When they considered what the day of the Lord was, They welcomed its coming because they believed that God would put an end to their enemies and they would make them, he would make them the rulers. But as will be made clear, the wealth and the power they had amassed was not the result of God's blessing, but the result of dishonest gain amassed by corrupt hearts. Far from being blessed, Amos, the shepherd and farmer from Tekoa turned prophet, made it clear that they were actually under the curse of God because The God they claim to be the people of is one who sees all and cares about all and judges all with perfect justice. So look to chapter two of, uh, look to verse two of chapter one and, and hear the words of Amos as one's received now like a preemptive earthquake intended to shake the very existence of God's people. To shake them into considering the state of their heart, their consideration of others in light of God's revealed word and most jarringly, to consider their relationship with God himself. Look to verse 2. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures and shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. Again, this probably doesn't mean a lot uh, to most of us at first reading, so, so let me explain. Before the rest of the the following six chapters of judgment begins, and it's a heavy word, Amos declares that Yahweh, the Lord, he, he roars from Zion. He makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. Who is speaking? How are they speaking? And from where are they speaking are all important to how we actually understand the rest of Amos as a whole. Who is speaking is made plain for us. You can see again in verse 2. It's the Lord. You can see right there. It says, it's the Lord. This is the covenant-making God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God who made his name known to Moses and displayed his power before Pharaoh, the God who rescued his people from Egypt, who led them through the desert into the promised land, defeating the enemies of his name on behalf of his people. What is to come isn't a whim of Amos' invention. It is the Lord who speaks. So when Amos speaks, he can rightly say, thus says the Lord. Well, how's he speaking? His, his voice is equated to the roar of a lion. This shows up again in chapter 3, verse 8, where the lion roar is equated with the Lord speaking. Now, that imagery might be a little bit lost on us because while there might be someone here who has uh, come within earshot of a roaring lion in the wild, it's probably fair to say that most of us have not. In Israel's days, lions inhabited Israel and Judah, and to hear the roar of the lion is to hear the assertion of authority. Where's the Lord roaring from? Well, he's roaring from Jerusalem. You can see that. From Zion, Jerusalem was the religious center of that the northern kingdom's rebel king had rejected 200 years previous. 
Israel's rebel king had built his own kind of imitation Jerusalem in Bethel and in a number of other places in the northern kingdom so that people wouldn't have to go down to Jerusalem to the other side to worship. But they knew that setting up alternatives to Jerusalem was not what they were supposed to do. The temple, the Ark of the Covenant, the seat of King David were all in Jerusalem, and that was the place that God's people were to go. You see, God actually does care. He actually does care how we worship him. And the lion is roaring, and this lion is the Lord, and he's doing so from the place where his name holds court. But unlike the earthly kings and governments who know their people only through the reports of others, the Lord is the one who sees all and evidently cares about all. He cares enough, in fact, to intercede. He cares enough to judge justly. And isn't this the kind of God that we we really long to exist when we see the brokenness and injustice in this world? When an army rolls through and rapes and murders those in their path. When girls in Nigeria are stolen from their school and forced to engage in unspeakable acts. When an investment banker wipes out the lifetime savings of millions through a corrupt scheme. When a government pushes death instead of offering help. When you're falsely accused, discriminated on the basis of your skin, intentionally passed over or overtly pushed out, you and I long for a God who exists, who sees all, who cares about all, and who will intercede and dish out divine justice. Now, because we're a people that have uh, the story of God throughout time available to us, the fact that God sees all and cares about all may not be something that we, we necessarily feel the weight of. But consider with me for a moment those in our world who do not know the God of the Bible. Those who are agnostic and hope there is a God of some kind out there but cannot be sure. Or those who worship some other God than that of the Bible. Either of these hope their God or whatever God might exist can see them. They hope this. And if that God can see them, but if if that God can see them, they can't be sure that that God will actually care. After all, why should he or she or it? And if they think that their God does in some way care, they cannot be sure that that God will intercede or has the power to ultimately judge and bring justice. But what we learn throughout Amos is that there is a God who sees all, who cares about all, and who will intercede with just judgments regardless of who the offending party is. We've probably all been in situations where we know of some injustice that was committed. Someone did something that everyone would agree was wrong. But because of the person's connections, the the person's wealth, the person's social standing, the person's claim to position, the, the charges never get laid. Or if they do, they get dropped because maybe an envelope changes hands. And there should be a sentence there should be, but there isn't. But, but even if there is, even if it somehow gets that far, it turns out just to be a slap on the wrist. We can taste the injustice of that. Maybe you can picture the arrogance of a young man whose family has money and fame, and so he offends time and time and time again. And knowing he's going to get off. But we all feel good when we see that the father of the son is just and he does not cover for his child's crimes, when he doesn't get him off the hook with a slap on the wrist, denying those wronged justice. And in Amos, this entitled son are God's people. And the father who is just is the lion whom we hear roar from his holy hill. He is not a father who turns a blind eye to the sins of his son and disregards justice to those who have been wronged. No, Unlike the gods, many hope exists. The living God sees all, cares about all, and judges the wrongs of all with perfect justice. And to be clear, God's people had racked up a list of wrongs that was staggering. In the weeks ahead, we're going to be looking at these in more detail, but know for now that God's people had willfully engaged in the mistreatment of the poor. The lives of the lowly and those who had little were were disregarded. The poor were were trampled in the presence of those who said they were God's people. The marriage bed was openly violated. And the sacred union given by God was profaned by those who said they were God's people. 
The worship God had ordained was replaced with a worship he had not, and his name was made merely a means for indulgence by those who said they were his. You can flip over to Amos 2. Just turn in your Bibles to Amos 2. Amos chapter 2 and verse 6, we get a summary of these things. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Israel for three crimes, even four, because they sell a righteous person for silver, a needy person for a pair of sandals. They trample the heads of the poor on the dust of the ground and obstruct the path of the needy. A man and his father have sexual relations with the same girl, profaning my holy name. They stretch out beside every altar on garments taken as collateral, and in the house of their God they drink wine obtained through fines. A few weeks back, we spent time in Luke chapter 8. It was there that Jesus made clear who were his, who were really God's people. If you remember back, there was a crowd around Jesus such that his mother and his brothers couldn't get through to see him. When he was told of this, Jesus responded, My mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. God's word had told God's people that they were to care for the poor, but they had used them for their own gain. God's word had told God's people that they were to be just, but they had had obstructed the path of the needy. God's word had told God's people that the union between one man and one woman was sacred, yet they had profaned his holy name by, was, by doing what was shameful to even speak of. God's word had told God's people how they were to worship, but they had perverted that worship with their thievery and their drunkenness. This isn't a people who sound like they have heard and done God's word, does it? Remember, those who hear and do the word of God are said to be those who bear good fruit. Jesus also said a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. He goes on to say, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed and the destruction of that house was great. For the people of God, of which many of us would count ourselves among, the question that hangs seems to be answered without question. Does God care? Yes. And the question doesn't exists just for them then, but for us today as well. Have you and I kept uh, the clothes as collateral of somebody for a loan? Have you and I trampled on the heads of the poor by selling them for a pair of sandals? Have you and I engaged in unspeakable acts that profane God's name? Likely no. But does God really care when you and I do the things we ought not do or do not do the things that we should? Does God care how we worship him? Does God care about how we pray or if we pray? Does God care about how we use our money? Does God really care about how we engage the poor? Does God care about where we go online, the kinds of shows we watch, the kinds of music we listen to? Does God care about how we use and consume things? Does God care about how you and I use the fleeting moments that make up our lives here on earth? Does God really care? And in a way that's intended to cause us pause, to to bring about repentance and reform, the living God who sees all and cares says yes. And this living God who sees and cares says that he will judge because he is just. And he will do so by his standard, not ours. And he will do so in the here and now for the good of the lowly, for the good of the oppressed, of the poor, of the mistreated. And he will do so in the final day with nothing but his glory in mind. One of the themes that will carry throughout Amos is this phrase, the day of the Lord. It's a day that God's people were anticipating and they were excited about because because if that came, it meant they won. But what they hadn't factored in was the possibility that they weren't actually his people. 
Oh, they had been born into the right family, but they were not counted among the righteous because they had not lived by faith, listening to God's word and living God's ways. And so God sends this chilling word through the prophet in chapter 8, verse 9. Look there. You can flip over to chapter 8, verse 9. Chapter 8, verse 9, where he says, And in that day, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I will make the sun go down at noon. I will darken the land in the daytime. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will cause everyone to wear sackcloth and every head to be shaved. I will make that grief like mourning for an only son and its outcome like a bitter day. Does God care? The answer is yes. And it should cause us pause who hear his voice through his word this morning. It should cause us to consider what reason, what reason such a righteous judgment might be levied on us and what hope you and I have, if any, to stand in that day. If you look back again to the second verse of chapter 1, we hear that the lion is roaring. And do you see what the effect is? In verse 2 of chapter 1, the effect of the lion's roar, the very land which raised the flocks on which the dishonest sacrifices on the high hills is laid bare. Look what it says in in verse 2. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. Who can stand? You see, you and I need the living God to be our father because you and I are the guilty son. No, we aren't guilty of what Israel was. But you and I aren't a people who have listened and done God's word without error. In fact, you and I are often intentionally disobedient. We know this to be true. But if you are a Christian, you do have a powerful Heavenly Father who has freed you from the eternal consequences of your sin. He's gotten you out. But because He is just, no bribe was paid, no dismissal, of, of, of what you have done is committed. No, our Father paid in full for your sin and mine when he sent God the Son to take on flesh and to die in our place. And because God cares, he promises to judge. God will speak judgment against the nations and against his people. God will judge his people and particularly their leaders. We will see this to be true later on. Especially because they're, they're of their sin-tolerant religion with mercy, with justice, and with certainty. God will judge us for our sin. This is certain. God's justice is based on his holiness, and God's mercy is based on his love. So how can these two things be reconciled for us in light of what we've heard? Simply in the cross of Jesus Christ. It is here that the holy God comes and takes on flesh himself. He lives as a man. God incarnate lives the perfect life and dies on the cross, taking the punishment justly due for your sins and mine. Then God raises Jesus in victory over death, and he invites us to repent of our sins and to believe in Christ. And in doing so, we find newness of life. Now, when God's judgment does roar, and it will, how will it find you? When the heavens disappear and the final angel's shouts occur and we appear before his throne, then in that day will you be a part of that other war, answering his, the one that we read about in Revelation 19. Listen, as I read, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for true and just are his judgments. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud pearls of thunder shouting, Hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. The question we began with, does God care, is answered definitively, yes. And the question now that remains for you and I is, Do you? Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, you know the nooks and the crannies of our hearts.
You know those areas in which we disobey you, which we ignore you, ways that we direct our own lives and our own ways. We pray that by a work of your spirit, we'll be able to see those things clearly and honestly. And we pray that you would give us a taste for you, that we would choose you above all other things. Oh Lord, do these things for your own glory and for our good. We pray in the name of our Redeemer and Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.